Hey, it's an all new enough already podcast, and we're going to talk about all the craziness that went on over the weekend in New York, New Jersey, Minnesota, and how the Democrats really haven't been talking about it. Do you mean the bombs? Can we mention the word bomb? I think enough time has passed. Oh. We've been briefed, so it's all good. So we had the bombings in New York, New Jersey, and then the stabbings in Minnesota. And prior to that, we had the excellent political rickrolling of Donald Trump on Friday, putting the birther debate to bed once and for all, to the consternation of the uh, leftist media. After we talk about all that, we bring on Sonny Johnson. By the way, Sonny may drop the F word once or twice while we talk to her. Yes, at least. Be prepared for that. (laughs) And we round things out with Ash Gal from the Washington Examiner and New York Observer, who's going to tell us all about how Hillary's stealing from her poorest supporters. Remember, you can always check out the Enough Already podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and the TuneIn app. And you can also find us on Facebook and at enoughalreadypodcast.com. All right, enough already. On with the show. What do you want to talk about? There's so much I, to talk about. Really, I think there's nothing to talk about. It's been a really slow couple of days. It's true. It must have been a really slow couple of days because the president of the United States has not come out publicly and said anything about what's happened <laughs> in the last couple of days. So it must be really a slow news weekend. Well, you're incorrect because he has spoken publicly both on Saturday and Sunday nights. But nothing about what has happened in the last couple of nights. Correct. I mean... As far, as far as I know, yes. I don't generally tune him in, though. Well, our friends over at the Drudge Report do. hmm And the lead on Drudge right now is, how many are there? FBI terror alert last week. Obama stays silent on bombings. Are we allowed to say it's a bombing yet? What, what are we supposed to be able to call it at this point? I don't know. I, I think it's okay now. Hillary had um, 12 hours to think about it. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We know at this point, by their reaction, that any kind of terrorist attack, especially on American soil, is bad for them. Because if it weren't bad for them, Hillary would have tweeted something 30 seconds after it happened, and they would be doing everything that they can to exploit these bombings. And yet, you have the President of the United States who has stayed silent for, well, let's see, the first bomb exploded, what, Saturday? Yes. We're recording right. Monday morning. Mm-hmm. Nothing from the President. And um, I have not been following Hillary's Twitter feed You're saying it took her 12 hours to say anything about this? Well, here's how it went down. So Saturday night, both Hillary and Obama were speaking at the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Awards Dinner Gala, whatever you want to call it. So I believe that the first bomb, well, the only bomb that went off that evening, because there were earlier bombs in New Jersey that day along the race course of a 5K that was to benefit marine charities. New Jersey, and, uh, that doesn't count, though. Right, right. Well, they're now saying that these were linked. Shock of all shocks, Jersey, where this took place, was not that far from New York City. Mm-hmm. So this happened, I believe the first bomb went off around 8.30-ish, or the only bomb that went off, sorry, 8.30. So um, being the news hound that I am, I was on Twitter, and I saw people starting to talk about this, and guess what? Somebody was periscoping, so I get to watch so I flip through the news because I love to see how far behind they are. <laughs> uh, and I go to Fox around nine. Judge Janine comes on. She's doing her opening statement rant. I flip over to MSNBC and CNN. And guess what they're carrying? Well, I would think it would be one of either the president or mm-hmm. Hillary. Speaking the president. 
Oh, was Obama was speaking. Okay. Yeah. Cutting jokes. Of course. So at that point, there were still some speculation. Was this just a gas explosion or was this a purposeful bombing? So MSNBC and CNN don't bother to cut away at all. They don't even put this up on the Chiron. I don't believe it was until about 930 that they actually started reporting on it. And at some point during this, Trump took the stage. I believe it was in Colorado. And he says there was a bomb that went off in New York City. We have to be more vigilant or whatever it was, you know, basically intimating that it was probably terror linked. I think anytime we have a bomb, we can just straight up call it terrorism. I don't know why we have to. I would hope we could at this point. Sugarcoat this shit. No, apparently that's acting rash. So I was watching CNN when the president finished. They cut back. It's Don Lemon and his assembled panel to talk about how wonderful that speech was. <laughs> And then Don interrupts to say, my mother texted me during all of this. And I thought maybe his mother was paying attention to other news and said, hey, Don, there was a bomb. And if you look at a map, CNN's headquarters is about a block and a half, two blocks from where this bomb oh, went Jesus off. Oh, Jesus Christ. So it's right in their backyard that this bomb has happened. And yet, no, his mother was texting him about some civil rights stuff. Because that's what Obama was talking about, of course. So then they decided that they were going to cover the bombing well in cnn's defense and in don lemon's defense maybe they are much like the president of the united states and the only way they would find out about the bombing is if they saw it on tv sure but this is how pathetic they are last week there was a new poll out and i can't remember the polling uh place that did this but they said only 30 percent of americans trust the media i'm surprised that number is that high i know i've seen one that was earlier this year that said only six (laughs) percent that seems but you you'd think that they'd be on their toes And just from a purely objective standard, if I look at this and they say, what's news? The president running his mouth about something that has nothing to do with current events. It's just his lamentations and I'm about to leave and everybody cry for me and scaring people into voting for Hillary. And or is it a bomb that went off down the street? And the fifth bomb of the day that we knew of at that point, because they had already found four in Jersey, one of which exploded. Uh, I don't know, Fingers. Which one of those do you think counts as news? I would hope that someone in the newsroom would say, you know, well, I'm really going to miss President Obama and I've got my Obama underwear on. Um, <laughs> we Shouldn't we? There, did you hear that explosion? <laughs> Sounded like right, right around the corner there. Did you, did you hear it? Yep. Maybe. Can we get a crew down there? Maybe. You think? I mean, there were periscopers down there before. One of them is a is a really well known guy, and he just rushed over there, and he actually has press credentials, so he was able to get in. So I'm watching his feed. Right. Oh, cool! That looks like a lot of trucks. Oh, look, there's the anti terrorism task force. I wonder why they're there. Huh? I don't think they'd be there if this was a gas main break. So then Hillary is uh, taking questions on her plane. Uh huh. After leaving this event in D.C., she looks. Absolutely haggard. Yeah. Tired as hell. And she comes out and says it was a bomb. And now, mind you, the press on Twitter had already started this thing about how irresponsible it was for Trump to come out and say it was a bomb. Oh, my God, was he briefed? What the hell is going on? This is terrible. This is ridiculous. This is unpresidential. All this nonsense. And then so she comes and says to her little press corral there, uh, there was a bombing, you know, We must support our first responders. I mean, this is just incoherent babble. Then they ask her, well, what do you think about the fact that Trump said it was a bomb like an hour ago? (laughs) I mean, honestly, and now they've since replayed it. There's a big article up on BizPack that I was just reading. Jake Tapper had Christy on yesterday on his Sunday show. And they cut out the first part of the clip where she says it's a bomb, too. But this is the level that we've sunk to now. Trump says it was a bomb. Oh, my God. It was a bomb. Burn the witch. And here is another difference between how a Republican president is reported and a Democrat president is reported. If George Bush were giving some kind of weird speech. Reading to children, you mean? Yes. um, They would split screen the president Mm -hmm. with 
footage of the anti-terrorism task force going to the bombing site to yes. show how out of touch the president of the United States is. Absolutely. And one of the jokes that Obama was making on stage was about ISIS. And I mean, it, it just can't get any more ridiculous. But I think the press is in full. I mean, they, they are more mad at Trump than they've ever been after he played them for fools on Friday. That's true. It, and I, it, I unfortunately, I get a sense that, you know, from our listeners and our international listeners, by the way, Tracy Connors. Hola, Chile. <laughs> right. But, of course, we just assume that people pay attention to this stuff like we do. But there are people out there that probably don't even know what Trump did on Friday. It's entirely possible. But you have to to fully understand what happened Friday. You have to backtrack to the weekend before where Hillary had her deplorables comment Friday. And then she went down in a blaze of glory on Sunday. And as Donna Brazil said yesterday who is now the chair of the DNC and a longtime Clinton hack, she had to be thrown into a van. Um, so she starts slipping in the polls. What does the press do to protect her? They well, drudge up the birther crap. Right. You immediately have to do something to change the conversation. Yes. And so we changed the conversation from Hillary's health to Donald Trump's health brief, briefly in the middle of the yes. week. To yes. To all of a sudden now we're talking birthers again. Of course. Donald Trump is patient zero for the birther thing, according to them. <laughs> so they keep pressing his people all week, every time they're on with any news network. When is Donald Trump going to make a definitive statement about his stance on the birther issue and the birth certificate and all this stuff? Like, he needs to be clear about what he thinks. Okay, okay, the, the announcement's coming. The announcement's coming. So they say, all right, all right he's going to make an announcement on Friday. He'll hold a press conference. So his brand new hotel in D.C., which is the old post office building, it's a stone's throw from the White House, I believe opened on Thursday. And uh, our good friend Sonny Johnson, who's going to be coming up in just a little bit, got to go and see this spectacular new property. So Trump holds a press conference there. He comes out, he speaks for just a couple minutes about the hotel and welcoming everybody. And then he turns the microphone over to a series of veterans who are highly decorated that sing his praises. For about 20 minutes, I want to say. And I'm watching the press on Twitter again, and they're all freaking out. Why are they still covering this live? This is ridiculous. They should cut away. This is so ridiculous. So they do cut away, some of them. CNN cuts back to their talking heads, and they, so they do the split screen where they mute the vets and talk over them, because so God they forbid. Do, they do have split screen. They do. They do okay. have that technology. I want to make sure. Then uh, Trump finally comes to the podium. And says about two paragraphs worth of information that I'm not going to be able to quote verbatim from memory yet, but pretty close. He says in uh, 2008, Hillary Clinton and her campaign started the birther issue. I finished it. I finished it. I think you all know what I mean. President Obama was born in the United States, period. Now let's get back to the business of making America strong and great again. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Bye. And they went batshit crazy. Oh, my God, we got played. Tapper referred to it as a political rickroll. <laughs> <laughs> so they are so incredibly foolish that they're angry as hell now at him. What so him getting? going out and reporting reality to people that have eyeballs and have experienced this stuff multiple times. We've watched it happen across Europe to go out and say, hey, there was a bomb in New York City. The audacity of this man which again points to media bias because the, the amount of anger that was thrown on social media over this this stunt by trump mm -hmm. the media has been played the media had been played for what tracy 280 290 days by hillary clinton yes before she, she stepped to the press conference it might have only been in the 270s but yeah almost three quarters of a year didn't have a press conference Everything was managed very tightly. She would do, you know, a Sunday show every once in a while. But the idea that this ticked them off, but <laughs> Hillary would not talk to them for three quarters of a year, not any anger at all. But she was more than willing to cough her non-communicable pneumonia all over them, <laughs> which the rest of her staff got, but it wasn't because it's infectious. Of course not. No. It was an honor. 
to catch <laughs> pneumonia from Hillary that Clinton. That strand of Clinton pneumonia. <laughs> it's, it's up on eBay right now. I think the reserve is thirty grand. <laughs> no, I actually thought about her this weekend. Oh. Um, I had to get away from the news for just a second. I had to go to the the DMV. Ugh. And I had to go to the DMV an hour and a half before it closed on a Saturday morning. And so there were about 80 people. Oh, this is brutal. What did you have to go to the DMV for? <clears throat> well, I bought a car oh. um, in Florida, and I live in Indiana, and so I had to get a VIN inspection. So I walked in and um, immediately caught a, uh, a whiff of someone's B.O., Mm. And I scanned the the crowd there, waiting to talk to the BMV people. And I, you just called them the BMV. Was that a Freudian? It should have been the BO. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess DMV, BMV, whatever it is. We called them the sec. It was the Secretary of State's office in in Michigan, but down here it's the, I believe it's the DMV. Mm-hmm. And I estimated probably anywhere from. 60 to 70 percent of the people in there hadn't showered that morning mm. and but on top of it i thought to myself okay i am walking in here feeling really good healthy i mean i'm fat but you know I'm, i don't have a cold i don't have walking pneumonia and i'm seeing grown adults coughing sneezing not covering their mouths wiping their noses on their hands i think i said okay i'm gonna walk in here healthy i'm gonna walk out of here Hillary Clinton. <laughs> That's what's going to happen to me. So I thought about former Secretary of State over the weekend, and it, I didn't think about anything regarding policy. I didn't think about what a great president she could be. I would. I, I immediately pulled the pneumonia card. <laughs> I'm wondering how many people, when pneumonia comes, you, you know, Trump did a great job. You hear the word crooked, and what do you think? Hillary. Crooked Hillary. Of course. Now are we to the point where a large portion of the population hears pneumonia and the first thing they think of is Hillary? Sure. She's it's the first brain. thing I think of. <laughs> I mean, if we were on the, the $100,000 pyramid, what, who was that? Dick Clark? Did he host that? Yes. Dick Clark. Yeah. If the word was pneumonia, I would say Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and you would either come out with crooked and then I'd say no. And then the second one, you would say pneumonia. And the thing is, that would be the $100 question. Probably, yeah. That, well, that wouldn't be the top of the pyramid question, which is supposed to be harder. It would be the first one because that would be so easy. Crooked. Uh, no. I don't know. Pneumonia. <laughs> Hillary. You might get a slip liar in there between the two, but. <laughs> but speaking of now, I know that you just finished the Hitchens book, No One Left to Lie To. Yes. So. In light of all this birther stuff, when Trump comes out and says Hillary Clinton's campaign started this in 2008, the press just refuses to believe this, that it was started by her campaign. They say there was a rogue staffer in, I want to say, Iowa or something like that that circulated an email, and he was immediately fired. So that's not a connection to the campaign at all, nothing to see. (laughs) So on Twitter... Somebody finds out there's a guy, I believe his name is Jim Asher. He used to be at McClatchy News. Now he's at a nonprofit. And he tweets out, and he's been tweeting this since March. And for some reason, somebody finally just started paying attention. That Sidney Blumenthal came to his office in 2008 peddling this story. And he must have been credible enough because McClatchy sent reporters to Kenya to figure this out. So now you are, it's fresh in your mind what a complete vile piece of trash Sidney Blumenthal is after reading Hitchens' book. Yes. And people are saying that we should trust Sidney Blumenthal's word. Of course. Over Asher at McClatchy. The Clintons and people associated with the Clintons don't lie, Tracy Connors. Oh, never. It's not a and especially not again. Blumenthal. Oh, no, of course not. Look, and the funny thing is, is, okay, this guy's talking, which, let's face it, I hope he has security. Sure. I I hope he has someone watching his back. Because when you say things about the Clintons, bad things happen to you. If you actually know what you're talking about, 
If you had someone in the room, if someone from the Clinton campaign reached out to you and you can expose them, bad yes. things can happen to you. Bad things, man. Heart attack gun, Tracy Connors. <laughs> Heart attack gun. Bad things can happen to you. So if you cannot tell me that if Sidney Blumenthal was shopping the story around, that he's the only one, but he's the only one with the guts to come out and say something about it. Correct. I mean, Sidney Blumenthal, as you know, had a really close relationship with Christopher Hitchens, who was at Vanity Fair. And so I did a little bit of searching because I have a decent idea of who Sidney Blumenthal is. I mean, this is, should be no big secret to anybody that's paid attention this whole time. He was so dis- hated by the Obamas after the way he behaved during the 2008 campaign when he was an, an advisor to her campaign that Obama barred him from having any government job. So she wanted to bring him to state. This is covered in the book HRC about her. So what did she do? They shoved him over at the Clinton Foundation, paid him 10 grand a month. And he's the reason that we know about her emails because he was sending her emails specifically about Libya and stuff like this. He wanted Gaddafi overthrown because he had some business interests there. But he was the one that was hacked by Guccifer. But I went on to... uh, David Horowitz's excellent website, Discover the Networks, the Encyclopedia of the Left, and I did a little reading about Blumenthal. Do you want to know what outlets he wrote for? Sure. Off the top of my head, I can remember he wrote for Vanity Fair, uh-huh. The New York Times, mm-hmm. The New Yorker, and The New Republic. You're going to tell me that he only went to McClatchy with this story? <laughs> really? So this tells me that he went to a whole bunch of different outlets. This is how this all works. And they all either ignored him, followed up on it or whatever, but they all knew about this. And they all know that he's the one that was doing it. But no one is stepping forward except for this cat. This poor guy who's now just being trashed everywhere. And people who should know better are saying, no, 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 no. I take Sidney Blumenthal's word over Asher's word. (laughs) This man is a known liar. He's the one that was trying to spread rumors that Monica Lewinsky was a crazed stalker. Right. And then he went and testified before the grand jury. I think he had to go four different times. He went in and testified, I think, believe the first time. And then he came out and on the steps, went into this whole rant about how they were shaking him down for who he was connected to in the press. And he was being unfairly targeted. Then months later, the transcripts come out and none of that ever happened. I still don't understand what it is about the Clintons that the left will bend over backwards to defend them more so than they would any other Democrat. Except Obama. Well, yeah, Obama. You're right. But it's simply amazing to me. And I don't understand. I mean, it would be one thing if Hillary were a charismatic, warm, likable person. Sure. Like if she were really her her Twitter bio. <laughs> if she, Grandma. Yeah. I'm just a Grammy. I care about kids and healthcare <laughs> and you. And we all know she can't stand people. Right. She right. can't stand being in the same room with people. What was it early on in the campaign this time around? She walked into a ch- uh, Chipotle or a. Yeah, it was Chipotle. It was a Chipotle and did everything she could to make sure she didn't talk to anybody. went in with her weird yoko ono sunglasses on i'm guessing uh ordered her chipotle which a woman in her condition should not be eating chipotle tracy connors no she's obese i don't know why we're not allowed to talk about that we were told all last week that trump is obese and i google hillary i think we've talked about this did i tell you what her weight comes up as (laughs) no and it says she's five foot six and weighs 130 pounds oh come on (laughs) i i'm not kidding you (laughs) That's funny. It's ridiculous. Five six one thirty. Yep. I'm guessing it's more in the range of one seventy to one eighty. Yes. Which would BMI wise make her obese. If you told me Carly Fiorina was was five six one thirty, I'd believe it. Correct. And yes. n- not Grammy house coat. No. <laughs> you don't. You don't wear. Fancy moo-moos in public if you're 5'6", 130. No. <laughs> that's 
It's absolutely it's crazy. Stunning. But no, be, for, forget the fact that she's obese, Tracy. Uh huh. You know, we joked at the convention that she pulled that Monty Burns act where they had her up on the screen there looking down um, over the ham and eggers. Uh, she's not well. Mm-mm. Apparently, uh, her innards are letting her down. <laughs> okay? There's no way she should be eating Chipotle. But on top of it, you think about her husband and how her Which... husband would handle Chipotle. Oh, remember when he used to jog to McDonald's? <laughs> Or was that that's just Saturday Night Live parody? I portion? think it was the Saturday Night Live parody, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if he. But he did jog a lot. Yes, and it in was such a short joke shorts because you know he probably didn't jog a lot. Mm-hmm. It was just like happened to have a cameraman on the beach when Bill and Hillary were dancing in their bathing suits. Yes, I mean, your thank favorite. God. Yeah, thank God we had a cameraman just happen happened to walk by them as they're dancing to no music on the beach because who you know i don't know about you tracy but when i'm on the beach and there's no music that's when i want to dance sure so i wouldn't be surprised at all knowing the clintons knowing their track record they alerted the white house press corps saying hey listen uh the president's gonna be going jogging here in a little bit uh stand right here (laughs) <laughs> they, they put a, an Arkansas sweatshirt on him. They sp- sprayed some water on his face and on his shirt to make it look like he was drenched with sweat. He jogged around the corner, waved to the reporters. Oh, beautiful day for a jog. Kept running uh, around the corner again and then hopped back in the limo <laughs> and headed to McDonald's. <laughs> Does that sound ridiculous with this group? I mean, anyone else? You'd think, oh, come on. That would. No, nobody would. The links to. Uh, you know, actually put on a sweatshirt and spray water. Sure they oh. would. <laughs> the Clintons would. Absolutely. And how many times did you see Bush bicycling? Because he's a big biker. Well, that's the other thing, too. I believed Bush was jogging. I believed Bush was riding a bike. Because if you look at the man, the man looks physically fit. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've seen me. It would be like me running out there. Look, I'm jogging. I'm jogging. Look at me. B- Bill Clinton always had that beer gut. Yeah. Except now where he's a vegan. Yeah. Cause and he looks emaciated. But here's a question for you. Why wasn't he with her at the 9-11 thing? It's a good question. Is that a little odd? I mean, they're New Yorkers now, right? Of course. And they, they love doing good work yes where's the, the where's the clinton home in chappaqua or something chappaqua, chappaqua yeah but he can't be bothered to show up at the 9-11 ceremonies the 15 year anniversary making some kind of mining deal <laughs> you know, in kenya or something with one of his canadian business friends see i picture him in a propofol induced sleep <laughs> either in an, an isolation tank or, I don't know, a sarcophagus. I'll never forget, uh, before Martin Brashear came to the United States and had his own show on MSNBC, do you remember that piece of crap that got drummed off of television? Well, I go back to before that show when he did that hour-long special on Michael Jackson. That's what I'm th- getting at. There yeah. was a point, there was a part in that special, which is one of the greatest TV events of all time, where I believe they were in Vegas and they were shopping because Michael loved shopping. Yes. And they saw a sarcophagus and it was all done up, you know, like look like King Tut's tomb. And Martin Brashear said to Michael Jackson, is that what you would like to be buried in when you die? (laughs) And Jackson goes, I'm never going to (laughs) die. But that's what I picture Bill and Hillary sleeping in at night. Something along those lines. Heavily drugged. Oh, see, I, I disagree. I think Hillary sleeps upside down. Sure. Well... I don't know. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> the second chin would choke her to death. <laughs> That's not nice, Tracy. She doesn't have five chins. She's five six and weighs 130 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I almost feel like posting a picture of myself because I'm five seven and I weigh 125 pounds. <laughs> you know what we need to start doing? We need to start buying you Hillary Clinton house coats. Oh, okay. 
I would do that. And compare how you look in a Hillary Clinton house coat to Hillary Clinton. Well, I'm told that she's a style icon. <laughs> I can't remember if it was the Washington Post that ran with this. How I mean, they were, yeah. anyone with a straight face say that, let alone print it? Like, there are women, Hill staffers, younger female reporters running out saying, where can I get a Hillary Clinton house coat? Mm-hmm. Certainly. And that line of pantsuits she has, <laughs> unbelievable. There was one picture that came out last week, and I don't know if it's... It had to have been taken in the last six months. It looked like someone had taken a black velvet tablecloth <laughs> from the 1970s. It was a floral print oh. and just added a zipper and sleeves and threw it on her. It's like, what the hell is that? It's unbelievable. I can't. I, they don't have a stylist on staff. I'm guessing they don't. I'm guessing that she takes care of all that maybe they do have someone come and say, listen mrs clinton uh secretary clinton oh, oh i'm sorry secretary clinton uh we have this wonderful new wardrobe here for i know what to wear i don't <laughs> need your help i am an icon of fashion is that what they call yes. her icon of fashion fashion icon. fashion icon fashion mm -hmm. icon yeah yeah it's ridiculous and she has access to all the greatest designers on the planet oh my gosh you know damn well that the Calvin Kleins of the world, the, the, oh. the that's the only one I know. Diane von Furstenberg, <laughs> all these women. Yeah, Stella McCartney. Oh, they would kill to be able to dress Hillary Clinton. And maybe they are. And they're just, they're like, I, you know what? We'll make this for you, but please don't, please don't, please don't mention our names. <laughs> I don't want to I don't be associated know. with this floral house coat you're wearing. I mean, honestly, some of the stuff she wears... I would expect an 80-year-old woman to throw on as she walks out to the mailbox. <laughs> yeah, she showed up in what looked like a, a tie-dyed burlap sack the other day when she came out of hiding her first post flamonia engagement. And I'm really pissed off that she started wearing those Yoko Ono sunglasses because now, because now people are calling her Yoko Ono. Oh, that was your thing. Yeah, she's Yoko Hildo. Correct. But to get back to your question about why people put up with this crap and why they run interference, I look at them as like the Harvey Weinsteins, and I'm probably I'm pretty sure you probably don't know who he is. He's one of the biggest producers and power players in Hollywood. And it's just known if you want to work, you don't cross him. Okay. So I think it's it's purely fear motivated. That you don't play with them because they play for keeps. And you've seen the uh, Clinton body count list. That... Yes. Well, I mean, that makes sense. I understand if you're a politician, you don't want to cross them. I don't understand the media. Well, they want access. But you don't get access as it is. I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I understand that way of thinking. It's like, oh, my gosh, if I say something bad about the Clintons, they'll, they'll cut me off. Well, when they don't talk to the press other than, you know, an occasional – news show oh well i'll go talk to george stephanopoulos or i'll i'll talk to the, the the folks over at msnbc but they don't do you know it's so controlled the messaging out of the clinton camp they don't do much press because they don't need to right why should they well she's gonna need to now because she's losing yeah and losing big league yeah the la times and i don't know what to make of this poll you know, I, I don't know what to make any of the polls, to be honest with you. Right. But you're seeing now today out of the the L.A. Times that Trump has his biggest lead of the race mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. We're looking at 40, almost 48 percent Trump, 41 percent Clinton. And he's been inching closer and closer to 50 percent. Yeah. But. Again, and you have been slamming this, I believe the LA Times poll is it's just a two person race, right? Yeah. And I don't think that at the end of the when uh, uh, November 8th rolls around, I don't believe that Gary Johnson's going to end up with 9% of the vote. I don't. He just said something over the weekend, too, that again just made me want to 
Oh, God. Take a ball peen hammer and smack myself in the head forever saying that I would vote for this guy. Um, gosh, and I can't remember off the top of my head what it was because I did end up hitting myself in the head with a ball peen. <laughs> It may have been something about the bombings. I can't remember, but it's just been a dis- – this campaign of his has been a disaster. And Absolutely. It's, and it's really a shame, too, because when his first ad came out where he you know, was standing next to that statue from Massachusetts and he said, uh, you know, you can – just give us a chance. And in sure. four years, if, if, if we suck, you can vote for a Trump or a Clinton. And it was really well done. Mm-hmm. And it, ever since then, it's it's just been a complete disaster. He's time and time again came out and shown everyone who is a libertarian that he's not a libertarian. Right. Yeah. No, it's it's embarrassing. I think. And I and I have to tell you, you were right. You were absolutely hmm. right. I thought that they should have gone with Gary Johnson because I thought that he could at least articulate libertarian philosophy you know and act like a libertarian because he's been a politician his entire life they should have gone with austin peterson yeah or even crazy uh, mcafee would have been more fun he understands the philosophy better and he's a loose cannon which is how you're going to get attention in this cycle yes you I-, I wish they would have gotten ron paul to come out of his retirement and just run one more time just to have that voice on the stage i don't think he could have won but if you want to see what a real libertarian should sound like, and I feel like this is semantical and it's annoying and I hated it when people talked about rhinos when I was a Republican, but Gary Johnson is not a libertarian. No. He's just not. And he's too nice for this. It's easier, don't you think? And this is one of the things I've noticed about people on the right. It's easier to attack Republicans than it is Democrats. Sure. And well, they just, fear attacking the left for some God knows what reason. Yeah. And it just seems to me Gary Johnson is just more comfortable attacking the right than he is the left. Sure. I mean, he's yeah. come out and, and said he's praised Hillary. She was a great public servant. I mean, who can could, who could say that with a straight face? He does. That tells and you it, that he's a politician. Absolutely. And, you know, it's a slap in the face to all the anti-war people. Yes. I mean, she is the biggest warmonger that's been on the ticket in a long time. But what has she done? I mean, I, I forget the Secretary of State stuff for a second. As a senator, what did she, did she sponsor? At the end of the day, was it like two or three bills? Yeah, it was like naming post office and stuff yes. like that. Great public servant. She kept a seat warm in the Senate. Right. That's all she did. Wow. <laughs> she had good attendance? Is that what you're telling me? Yep, That's what perfect makes a good attendance public record. Servant? Sure, she showed up. Hmm. Well, more than we could say for Marco Rubio, I guess, but... That's true. Still, I mean, my God. And then you go to the Secretary of State, and that was a disaster. Mm-hmm. And as much as she, she could try, at the end of the day, for those that are paying attention or who have been paying attention, she doesn't get a reset button. No. People remember this shit. Which Absolutely. Is, which is why she's polling at 41%. <laughs> I mean, how many times have we seen them say, we're going to reintroduce Hillary Clinton? At least yes. they've given that up. You can't reintroduce someone who's been in the public eye for over two decades. Oh, two decades? Try three. We're in the middle of the third decade of her yeah. in so our over lives. Over two decades. Okay. Yeah. Is that two decades? Is it over two decades? I don't know. It, it's just such an incredible disaster. And the fact that they still don't know how to handle a terrorist attack <laughs> is beyond me. And they think it's going to be helpful. And I saw somebody that was on this morning on Fox that's a Democrat, just, you know, shameless talking points peddling Democrat, saying, oh, you know, this is not going to change much. The only people that are swayable at this point in time are college-educated women, and they're sticking with Hillary. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm a college-educated woman, and I was never going to vote for her. But I can't imagine that my other friends that see this stuff, and they look, and they look, okay, there was a terrorist attack. It was clearly a terrorist attack on Saturday night. And she had to wait 12 hours to put out this long statement that nobody's going to read. 
instead of just standing up and saying, this is terrorism, we need to get tougher on this, we need to be smarter, we need to be vetting people, because now they have released the name of somebody they believe is connected to this, because the dum-dum used the phone, you know, these were pressure cooker bombs, Mm -hmm. and I'm always thrown off that they're called pressure cookers, because I've always known them as crock pots, so that's what that is. There's a crock pot with a phone strapped to it, and somebody calls the phone, and that's when it goes kaboom. Right. So this moron had his phone connected to the phone, the bomb phone. And that's how they've supposedly been able to find him. But he was a uh, Afghani born. Mm. And then you have the, the attack in Minnesota. And as soon as that happens, you automatically think, Oh my God, these it's probably a Somali. Yes. And who was secretary of state when they oversaw all this importation of Somalis that they stuck in Michelle Bachman's district in Minnesota, the great public servant. Right, because when you think about, okay, we have to resettle a bunch of Somalians. For God knows what reason, we need to give them refuge here. I assume it's something that the Clintons did with, in, during their time in office, Black Hawk Down and all that mm-hmm. fun stuff. Um, where would you resettle a bunch of Somalis? Well, you have to do it in a Republican district. Right, but would you do it somewhere that kind of looks like home? No, no, of course not. I mean, oh, you, wanna- <laughs> you got to put them in Minnesota or maybe South Dakota, Wyoming. Yes. Stick them under about 10 feet of snow. (laughs) Surrounded by a bunch of northern Europeans. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota. Yes, I have. But you're probably a midget there. I mean, I was a midget there. And I'm normally not that midgety. I'm about, you know, a little bit above average height. But my God, did I feel small. You're 5'7", apparently. Yeah. But when I put on one of those house coats, it makes me look <laughs> obese. No, I was actually in uh, Minneapolis for New Year's Eve, the uh, 1999 going into 2000. Okay. Uh, 1999, uh, New Year's Eve. Um, it was minus six degrees. The yes. perfect place to put a Somali. I was there for fall break my senior year at Penn State. Mm-hmm. So it was October. There were three. F- there was already three feet of snow on the ground. <laughs> And I was coming from Happy Valley, which is not the warmest place on earth right. either. But my God, I was like, why do you people live here? But they're all Scandinavians. So to them, it's kind of temperate. Yeah. Every Pretty much, I would say 80% of the people that I saw there were blonde and nobody was under six feet tall. I don't remember the height thing, but I do remember a lot of blondes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, going back to what you were talking about earlier, let's face it. They know that this hurts Democrats. Oh, 100%. So if, if this were another police shooting, yes. they, would ha- they would march the family of the person who got shot in front of a camera somewhere in the neighborhood of 38 seconds after it happened. And every Democrat would pull a Chuck Schumer and run to a camera as soon as they possibly could to be able to comment on how awful police shootings are. We need to do, do what we can to... Um, alleviate this problem um, and you know black people aren't treated fairly in this country It'd be the whole thing that we've been hearing now for for a couple of years but it's a it's a terrorist attack and this is what I've been saying since last year when I heard people say well Trump can't win <laughs> no way Trump can win okay right. wait wait six seven weeks before the election see if there's a terrorist attack see if somebody attacks a school see if I and I, this thing that happened in New York Mm -hmm. I'm really surprised this doesn't happen more often because as Americans, we're used to getting out of our cars. And if you got um, a McDonald's bag or something, there's always somewhere where you can throw out your trash. Mm -hmm. There are public trash cans everywhere. I'm surprised that this hasn't happened before more often than it does. And we may see this where somebody just throw a bomb in the trash. Yeah. Americans don't know any, you know. Aren't suspecting? They're just going to walk up, get ready to throw their trash out. Boom. Somebody And again, Tracy, someone found a flip phone. They're apparently (laughs) out there because that's what they're using. They're using flip phones. Well, that's I mean, that's the way to do this and cover your tracks. Right. But this idiot apparently put his own cell phone number into the phone or somehow that that phone was connected to his phone. It's just like I, you know, they obviously did a little bit of research. You don't just offhandedly know how to make a bomb using a crock pot. Right. But you'd think you'd just buy two disposable phones. You would think. It, Once, it's you know, sh- some of these people want to get caught. That's true. But see, if they want to get caught at that point, you might as well just go full suicide vest. Yeah. 
because no good is going to come unless you want to get into prison and start radicalizing people in prison. Exactly. Which is effective. But, you know, de Blasio, the fine mayor of New York, was another yes. one that didn't want to jump to conclusions. It was hilarious. It was obviously intentional, but we won't call it. Really? <laughs> obviously intentional. I'm serious. He used the phrase intentional. <laughs> this is the problem with the Democrats. They can't keep up this illusion that we live in an alternate reality, any, that, which is what they've been trying to do for eight years. And they've been fairly successful with that. You're not really seeing what you think you're seeing. Right. This is what's actually going on. Everything's great. Wonderful. Watch the Obamas dance for the hundredth time to Stevie Wonder at the White House. <laughs> it's all good, kids. It's all good. But then you finally have somebody that steps up and is like, what the hell is going on around here? This place is a mess. We got bombs going off in New York City. We had a bomb going off in New Jersey today. They found more bombs. I don't know if you heard about this on the train tracks. Yes. Yeah. This is not good, kids. And it's I, and to me, I think it's only going to get worse as we get closer yeah. and closer to the election. But my question to you, Tracy, and we only have a couple of minutes left before we bring Sonny Johnson on. Mm -hmm. You believe Trump is going to smoke her. Oh, I believed he's going to smoke her since last August. I believe that there is a good possibility Trump is going to win. But I feel at this point that Trump is not running against Hillary Clinton. He's running against Donald Trump. Mm. He's been very, very, very good ever since the campaign changed over into the hands of uh, Kellyanne and Steve Bannon. And who would have thought that? I mean, that, I the, Kelly, the Kellyanne part, I, I am not surprised by. But everybody on social media on the right, the hand wringing. Yes. About Steve Bannon joining the campaign. Yeah. And... You know, I saw some people on the right complaining about what happened Friday with the the press conference. That had Andrew Breitbart written all over it. Absolutely. That was masterful. Absolutely masterful. And you know it was effective because the Congressional Black Caucus that was having the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation weekend or whatever, they all ran right out to the cameras yes. and tried to convince people. This was my favorite thing ever. Trump says Obama was born in America, period. They say, he, oh, my God, he's trying to delegitimize the president. This is the message coming out of the mouths of James <laughs> Clyburn and Hank Johnson and Sheila Jackson Lee and Barbara Lee and all these people. Uh, like, these two things do not add up. You can't tell me that that man just commandeered every single major news network, got them to cover him saying Obama was born in the United States. And then you're going to tell me over here that that's undermining the president. They weren't speaking to us, Tracy. Of course not. And they know how the media is going to report what mm -hmm. happened on Friday. Mm -hmm. And that was their response. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it plays. No, it's bad because I saw a Reuters poll from last week that showed he's at 23% of black support now. If that's true. It's done. And you're seeing um, there's a the Washington Post piece today saying among Democrats deep concern about Hillary Clinton's Hispanic strategy. Mm. And I, I won't get into the details of the piece other than saying that obviously they feel that she's underperforming. She's underperforming with Hispanic voters, Tracy. How's but she's been possible? tweeting in Spanish. <laughs> I kid you not. Go to her Twitter feed. Well, obviously she's going to have to go on some sort of, you know, um, Latino radio station and say with that her she, hot carries, sauce? she carries salsa in her purse. Yeah, I mean, they like Tapay Tio. She could, two birds, one stone, if that's the hot sauce she carries. <laughs> Any Mexican restaurant that's worth anything has a bottle of Tapay Tio on the... I'll take your word for it. I only go to Chipotle. Oh, see, I only go to real Mexican restaurants, because Chipotle is evil. <sighs> well, we have Sonny Johnson next, Tracy. This is going to be so much fun. <laughs> Well, we have right now with us the host of Did She Say That? It's Sonny Johnson. I oh, what's, oh, you wasn't recording when I was cursing just now. I'm trying to be a good girl on shows that I go on since I curse so much on my podcast. Oh, we want you to curse on our <laughs> podcast. That's the whole okay, thing. then what the fuck is up, people? <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to add in there, Fingers, that Sonny also works for the noted alt-right outlet, Breitbart. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, kiss my whole ass. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you can go and you can check my record. From the time I've started, I've been saying the same thing. So if that's considered alt right, then there's some of the <laughs> stupidest fucking races I've ever seen in my entire life. So I'll just leave it there. Because if you're going to have someone as loud and, you know, boisterous about, especially about empowering the black community as as I am, as your token black person, then you are a dumb white supremacist. So I'll just leave that right there. <laughs> well, before we get into politics and stuff, I, I have to ask you, I'm looking at your Twitter feed, and last night apparently a complete stranger came <laughs> up to you last night and uh, paid you 40 bucks to call him insane. Okay, so look. They want to talk politics. I have told people I I don't like talking politics with people that don't know shit and people who don't want to learn shit. So you just want to go off like all the progressive lies that they've taught you. So I don't I don't talk to people like that. So I had this guy. Uh, my husband loves to brag on me. So we were kind of out and this guy, you know, jumps in my face and I'm like, yo, dude, I get paid by the hour. You know what I'm saying? People pay me to hear me speak. I'm not going to fucking talk to you for free. And he literally pulls $40 out of his pocket. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I'll take it. And then I basically destroyed him on the war on drugs, how he tries to say basically that it was the white people that know it was your congressional <laughs> black con um, Congress that wanted tougher laws on black drug dealers. And they were the ones that start sending them to fucking jail. So, like, if you don't know what the fuck is going on, by all means, come and pay me and I'll take your money to make you look stupid. I will do that gladly. Capitalism at its fucking finest. <laughs> Did he concede the point? No, I walked the fuck off with my money in his pocket. I would have bought me, and I would have bought me this cute little speaker, and I came back and I listened to hip hop, and I'm like, how pissed would he have been if he knew that that's what I did with his money? It's a beautiful <laughs> thing these days, idiots. Now, Sonny, are you looking forward to personally offending Barack Obama on November 8th by voting for Donald Trump? I've been to him in 2008 like, <laughs> for the first time. So I think I have been offensive for like the last eight years. This whole, you know, term I've been fucking offensive. So what the fuck? Join the club, <laughs> black people. It's cool over here. I'm still alive, still kicking. Got more money in my pocket than I did when I started. So that's a good thing. Wealth over poverty, motherfuckers. Come on. <laughs> and Come you're on. hanging out at, at Trump International now, huh? Well, A, I cannot wait. Look, they have uh, Johnny Walker Blue Label in the world. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm like, okay, this sounds good. Chocolate covered strawberries and shit. Two separate bathrooms. So I can <laughs> chill it in one and you can go use the other one. It's, oh my gosh. It was fucking beautiful inside the hotel. And then to see... Um, Donald Trump played, followed a bouncing ball with the media the next day. <laughs> that was fucking, I mean, come on. This is, has this not been like the greatest fucking election cycle, at least of my fucking lifetime. Yes. I'm following Pepe around saying, kick up Pepe. You know, like all the videos are coming out now. And I'm just, and to hear Hillary Clinton like mention the fog. <laughs> I, you know, like trolling has got to the point where Hillary Clinton has to talk about it and talk about Pepe. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, right wing new media. C good fucking job. Congratulations. Keep going. Don't stop. <laughs> well, can you assess the performance of the Congressional Black Caucus on Friday after Trump politically rickrolled the press? They, okay, here, here's what's happening. Okay, and I'm going to get serious on this one because this, this is some serious shit. What's happening right now is their worst fucking fear. Their worst fucking fear is that black people wake up to the simple fact that it is better to have money in your pocket than to be begging government for anything. Now, they have had the experiment with Black Lives Matter. So they went through the protest. They talked to their congressmen and all of this shit in their black dominated democratic neighborhoods. And they're realizing that they're not going to do shit for them. 
So it is no longer a matter of Republicans having to prove that what we are and what the fuck we aren't. Black people are seeing what Democrats are not, and they are seeing it clearly. Now is our opportunity to show what we are, and that is the entrepreneurial builders, creators, wealth innovators that we were supposed to be and where we're destined to go if we get from under these fucking progressive policies. So I'm not... Their legacy is on the line. 60 years, and this is all they have to um, to lean on. I've been doing this for 60 years or 30 years or 25 years, however many fucking years you've been in Congress, neglecting your black neighborhoods and pushing them further into fucking poverty. Their achievements include making sure more black people are on welfare, making sure... Um, failing black schools continue to be failing black schools to make sure there is no entrepreneurial effort in these black communities to actually build wealth. They don't believe in you owning property. They don't believe in you protecting yourself with guns. They have no belief that black people are civilized enough to live in this fucking society. And now we are waking up to realize we are more than what they have fucking placed us as. And they should be scared. I hope they're shaking in their fucking boots. I could care less what come out of their mouth because these days in it, this day and age, we have our own platform. We have our own microphones. And there's a lot more of us standing up and telling them to kiss our whole black ass to make this election. <laughs> election cycle <laughs> worth it oh my god what do you think projection wise he's going to take what percentage of the black vote will he will trump end up getting regardless okay i being and i'll say this again i was the first black when when trump came out and he mm -hmm. announced he was running for president. I said it that fucking day. If he makes it throughout, and that was my concern, I didn't think he would make it past the GOP. So I had to eat crow on that one. Mm -hmm. But I said if he made it past the GOP, he would garner the largest percentage of the black vote of any Republican mm -hmm. in the last 60 years. And I stand on that. To me, the number is negligible. You know what I'm saying? The number doesn't matter. What's cracking through is the ideology, the idea that wealth is something to be grown, something to be developed. You're not worried about who getting what slice of what motherfucker pie. You too busy baking your own pie. That is what is more concerning for me, that we have cracked the progressive ideology that tells us we must beg government in order to get something. That is being destroyed. To me, that is the biggest thing because now we can actually start having honest conversations about how we change shit rather than keep playing bouncing fucking ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, my concern is, okay, you've got Trump pushing this message to the black community, but say Trump loses or Trump becomes president but then leaves office is the Republican Party smart enough to be able to pick up that ball and continue moving it down the court no look this, <laughs> look these okay let me I, I'm gonna be on some honest shit do you know what the never Trumpers look like to me what's that the never Trumpers look like the motherfuckers that didn't want me to come to their conference Mm -hmm. The never Trumpers look exactly like the motherfuckers that told me I had to stick with social issues because black people don't understand issues of economics. <laughs> That's who the motherfucking never Trumpers. They look like the same group that would get in front of me and question my intelligence. And then when I put them in their motherfucking place, they sleep off in their motherfucking hole never to be heard from again. <laughs> but they make sure they put enough stabs in your back that other people don't give you the chance or opportunity to take the stage with them again, lest you show exactly how stupid they are. That's what they are. These are the people who want to cry, we are the party of Lincoln, but would rather pray for low black turnout as opposed to actually engage black people. That is what never Trumpers look like to me. So if they want the Republican Party, come pride out of my cold, dead hands. It's not <laughs> yours anymore. We broke you. We beat you. Now you got to come and take it from us. And if you think it's that motherfucking easy, game on. <laughs> so who have you been fighting harder this election cycle? The Never Trumpers or the Hillary people? See, that's the thing. They smart enough not to come. Do you know what's the funniest thing? I don't fight anybody. Mm-hmm. 
I like sitting in this little patch of common sense that most people hear me and say, huh, that makes common fucking sense. And so I don't usually end up fighting. The most of them is so like the the intellectual Republicans who want to jump in and be like, well, you weren't saying that with. Oh, yes, I was, motherfucker. I was saying it when Bush was president. Don't mm. play that shit with me. I don't play the partisan. You did that shit then. You told us, well, Romney isn't really a conservative, but he's acceptable enough. Now you're saying, well, Donald Trump is a conservative, so I can't get the fuck over yourself. Like, completely. We we bought into your bullshit for two election cycles that I was participating in this system. Don't be mad we're not bought, uh, buying into it anymore. We don't want to pay $2,500 to take your cruise for you to tell us what the fuck you think. <laughs> That's not who we are. We don't want you. We don't need you. And keep telling us about how long you've been doing this. Because as long as you've been doing this, my community has been under poverty and your bitch ass hasn't done anything to stop it. So please, please talk to me about how you want to take the party of Lincoln Mantle and wear it so I can destroy destroy you with it. So what, I'm getting the sense that what you're saying is if Trump doesn't win and the Republican Party is broken, you don't have faith that Mitch McConnell will put the pieces back together? <laughs> okay, that's just sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I took you serious for a second. No, no. No, I don't. Like, the, the establishment, I would say this. The establishment, the best hope they have is Paul Ryan. And Paul, that's basically because Paul Ryan has an actual plan that I think, given actual Republican backing, would do wonders, especially in urban America. But he doesn't have a fucking backbone. Mm -hmm. So you were vice presidential nominee under Mitt Romney, and he asked Mitt Romney, look, let's go to these black communities. Let's do it. Mitt Romney said no, lest he offend somebody that's giving him money or what the fuck ever the circumstance was at the time. So you shut the fuck up and back down. Where is your backbone? You have no fucking backbone. But you can come out and, lect and lecture Trump, though. All of a sudden, when you got to stand up to Trump, you get a motherfucking backbone. So if anything else, if the Republican, if Trump wins this election, at least we will see Congress regain some of his power back because both of them hate him so much that they would actually make sure there are three separate branches of government again. And maybe that would be a good fucking thing. Now, do you look at this at the way that I do, that this is about culture more than politics or policy, this whole election? Fuck yeah. Isn't it great? Yes. Isn't it great? <laughs> and, and the reason I say that, and that's not to say that the intellectual arguments don't need to be made. Mm -hmm. The only reason I say that is because Republicans and conservatives get their ass kicked in the intellectual arguments. Like, that, if, if you could win in those arguments then I would say, go ahead. But I have watched you get your ass kicked for eight fucking years. So stop it. We have been more, like I have said, Pepe has been more effective <laughs> than some of these fucking Republicans and their intellectual arguments. So you take $10 million, you put together white papers to prove how fucked up the black community is when you could have just asked me and I would have told you it was fucked up and saved you $10 million. But... You do that, you put together these white papers and then you stand on top of it, like, say, a Jason Riley. And you stand on top of it, but not one black person is listening to you. So you spent $10 million, but you feel good about yourself. No actual effectiveness. Nothing fucking happens. $10 million is gone, but you feel good about yourself. That's a fucking waste. Now you have viral videos of people simply hitting record on their cell phone saying, we're not buying this bullshit anymore. Not even $10 million. It takes 15, 20 minutes. Right. And now you're changing the entire conversation where these Republicans are spending all this money on these white papers. It's get the fuck out of here. Well, that's the thing. You know, you talk about them losing the argument. I don't recall them actually making an argument. Making the argument. Oh, no. You have to win it on abortion. You have to win it on gay marriage, which you lost. <laughs> remember, look, you remember that? Look, it, this is so fun. What the fuck have you won? Give me a fucking victory that I can hang my head on. I didn't sign a suicide pact when I turned into a conservative. I didn't say I was going down with your sinking motherfucking ship. 
No, I am a conservative. I will build my own fucking ship and watch yours go down. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did, we just got on that ship and said, give us the wheel for a minute. They don't think want us we know to have the wheel. Right, right. They don't want us to have the wheel. That's why, but in all honesty, I, I, I've tried that. Y'all don't want to play. Y'all don't want to play nice. Y'all don't want to. You don't want to coexist. You don't want the wrong kind of black person to come into the Republican Party. I get it, but I learned a trick. You can't stop me, bitches. So right. they come in regardless. You better get ready for it. You better start liking it because whether you like it or not, they're coming. And a lot. The funny part is, I have a lot of uh, black. Uh, conservatives and Republicans come in to me now and they're like, yo, did you see what I did? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I did. You cussed a white progressive out. Five years ago, they wouldn't have done that. Right. We, right. Are, at a, we are at a completely different point where now black conservatives and Republicans are not running to the plantation. Now they're like, take your white privilege and get the fuck up out my face. Like the whole conversation has changed. And I am in love with the atmosphere right now just because we are actually having the conversations that we've been prevented from having the whole time that I've been in the political game. And it seems like because Trump refused to play the politics of respectability, that whole and game. It's easier for the rest of us not to have to play it either. Yep. Absolutely. And I've seen the rise of Hotep Twitter, which you're super popular on. If you want to explain that briefly, because I had no idea that existed and you brought it to my attention. And it's an entirely different offshoot of black Twitter, right? It's the beautiful, it's the beautifulness of black Twitter. It's, it is people that seek out the individual, their individual spirit, their individual accomplishment. They may disagree. Some of them are completely sexist. I mean, sexist. So don't go on there if you got <laughs> tissue paper feelings because that's not the bunch you want to be around. Free speech advocates, Second Amendment advocates, entrepreneurs, people who want to build, who want to own, who want to be millionaires, billionaires. Break the hierarchy by creating your own hierarchy. This is what all of this is about. And then, of course, you find your little subset. But there's no arguing. There's no bickering. You're not called a coon because you disagree with somebody. You're not put off the black. You know, your black card isn't revoked because you have an opinion that somebody doesn't like. It is actually a free space for black people to talk amongst themselves about empowerment. Now, it ain't no crybaby, woe is me, <laughs> I'm a fucking victim. You will get eaten a fucking live if you come in there with that, with that kind of talk because that's not what exists there. Hotep is all about you knowing your own power, your own strength, and then you moving forward on it. So I don't claim their mantle. I am a black conservative. That's where I stand. But I respect the hell out of them and everything that they do. And so I try to make sure I elevate as many of their voices as I possibly can because I learn from them. They inspire me. So I want to make sure that other people hear their voices. That's my promise I made to Andrew, always more voices. And right now we're kind of in that whole tap phase and I'm proud of it. I think it's awesome. And you were telling me, speaking of more voices, are you allowed to talk about how Trump is picking surrogates to go into the cities and what they're allowing them to say and not to say? Well, from all I know is I went to a the, the meeting that I went into uh, Trump Hotel, what was made apparently clear to me, abundantly clear to me, I should say, is that um, they are not pu pushing a national message downward that they are actually understanding that different communities have different problems and that those people who go into those communities to organize need to be the ones who develop the message for those communities. Now, that is one of the smart... I have never heard that out of, mm -hmm. you know, a Republican or conservative group that you actually turn the message over so that it could be targeted. It almost sounds like Republicans remember that this is a republic and not a democracy. Lord <laughs> forbid, you know, we go back to the classic shit and remember what we actually are and actually fight accordingly. But in all senses, that's what I'm being told. That if, like, if poverty isn't the biggest issue in your community, then you don't need to be going in leading with poverty. Go in face with what is you know, first and foremost on, on the menu in your community. That is how America is, is supposed to be run. Government at its most basic form closest to the people. Mm -hmm. 
That is what scares Democrats. Like yeah. more than more than the national election. If you get black people realizing that they can actually run and control their closest community, then you lose your school boards. You lose your city council. You lose your agenda 21 branches. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You start losing all the tentacles that progressives have put into the heart of our communities. You lose everything. So that is what they fear the most. And I, I, I didn't know if I would ever get to live to even see a crack in their armor in my <laughs> lifetime. But now I've seen, as, as, as Hillary Clinton says, I've seen the glass ceiling cracking. <laughs> and I just can't wait to like deal with that final fucking blow to see it all come down. <laughs> Seriously, honestly, that's like my dream. I and know. But sit back with a bottle of Patron and, and <laughs> watch it happen. You know, or if I'm at Trump Hotel, I'm gonna be drinking um, Blue Label. So either Heck way, yeah, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> no, I said to you, November eighth, maybe we should be in the bar at Trump International. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I did want to go to one other place with you because I listened to your podcast. Did she say that? I think it's excellent. And uh, you were talking about a young man that was murdered in Ferguson named Darren Seals. And I don't think a lot of conservatives, libertarians, all those know that there's another side to Black Lives Matter. We just think of them as the, the Soros funded group. But there are other people on the ground that are actually trying to make change and not just collect change from people that want to throw money at them. So you want to tell us about Darren Seals? So Darren Seals was one of the original organizers of Ferguson. OK, so I'm not going to discuss Mike Brown or anything. That's that's not the fucking point of this conversation. He was one of the main organizers from Ferguson. Now, his agenda was we have what we need in Ferguson to fix it ourselves. So if you're going to be putting funding into this, if this is what you want to do, if you really say that black lives fucking matter, give us the funding and we will be the change in our community. So of course that's not that's not a progressive message. You can't do that. So they skyrocket D-Ray ass in there. D-Ray becomes becomes the face of Black Lives Matter. Why? Because he'll follow the agenda. He'll make it about the police. He'll make it about stay woke. It, it started as let us fix what is wrong. Because there is some real shit that is wrong. And whether you want to argue about it or not, even the DOJ itself said that the reason that there is so much police interaction is because they needed the money to pay um, like a form of taxation. Mm -hmm. So that's why the police was always fucking with your black ass because they couldn't tax you from your non-paycheck. So they had to find another way to tax your ass. So that's why they keep creating all of these new laws to criminalize you. So that's even what the DOJ report says. So you have people on the ground who are actually saying that there is something wrong, that we need to fix it. We, the people on the ground, the community needs to fix it. Those people get overlooked for the D-rays that bring in Black Lives Matter, the group, the function that is taking George Soros money, that has uh, paid agitators and organizers come in and start shit and make it look like it's something that it's not. Those are where the cameras go. All of the media goes towards them. So now you get these perfectly screenshot photos of D-ray and a Stay Woke t-shirt like that isn't all about branding and capitalism and making money for the cause and putting like all of it is a fucking ah it fucking hate. <laughs> then you have people like Darren Seals who actually give a damn about what is happening in the community. You have people like the um the college groups that came out to clean up after Ferguson was over. You had the church groups that came out to try to help people salvage what was left and feed the people that had lost, you know, their businesses and they were trying You had good black people trying to do what was right. The cameras left as soon as they went to work. And then they followed D-Ray to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. It's followed a fucking bouncing ball. And then as Republicans and conservatives, we followed the bouncing ball. 
We are supposed to be the ones that give a fuck about the people, but the people were still there yelling that something is fucking wrong. We follow D-Ray. So mm -hmm. everywhere D-Ray goes, we fucking follow like he is an exemplary person of the people. Now, Darren Seals get killed. He's found shot in his car, car set on fire, basically like a hit job. Mm -hmm. Nobody says his name. Without Darren Seals, there is no Ferguson movement. There is no start to all Black Lives Matter bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So the real founder is killed and nobody in Black Lives Matter says his name. And he's not the first one, right? He's not the first one. He's about the sixth one. Which is unbelievable. And they're shot in their car with their car set on fire. But you don't hear any of that. Because all you hear is the bouncing fucking ball. Yeah. And I want to tell, we have the people in place. A lot of Black Lives Matter, the people who claimed it, they are awakening to see they really believe that black life matters. Mm -hmm. Get what I'm saying? They don't yeah. want to wait till black people are dead to say their name. Nobody is putting a camera on them. D-Ray gets all the cameras. So what I try to do is I want to make sure we are putting spotlights on people who believe that black people have the ability the purpose and the drive to save our own communities because those are the people that never get hurt. Those are the people that we as, because do you know, I got into it with Jason Matera about this uh -huh. because I, all black lives, all of them are just this, that, this, that, this, that. I said, what about Darren Seals? Well, he was this, that too. No, he wasn't. You don't know shit about him, but you can jump in because you're so desperate to fucking fight the left. You're so desperate to, to, to destroy the democratic narrative that you don't even stop to fucking learn what the fuck it is you're talking about. <laughs> now, what makes you any different from a fucking progressive? Nothing. Nothing. So if you want, I don't give a fuck what lane you stay in. But if you coming into my motherfucking lane, if you want to talk about things that are happening in my motherfucking community, then make sure you know what the fuck you're talking about. Because if you don't, that is the one time you see me snap off and I don't care who you are at that point. So just to wrap it all up, you have the people like Darren Sills. They're not going to talk like Thomas Sowell. They're not going to be dressed like Alan West. They're not going to have the intellect of Clarence Thomas. But they do have the scars. They have the bruises of being bought up in these communities. And they think that they can be the solution to the problem. Let them be the solution. See Sonny snap off on Twitter at Sonny Johnson. <laughs> Catch your podcast. Did she say that? Y'all bring the most ratchet side out of me. <laughs> <laughs> we have to go, but before we do, anything you got coming up here in the next week that we should know about? Uh, podcast drops on uh, Wednesday, and um, we're going to be talking about how the war on drugs actually started. And believe me, it didn't start with Nixon. It started with that Congressional Black Caucus. So we're going to be talking about that and giving more history. I love to give history about what progressives have done and, and how they actually set up this trap. So that's going to be coming up on Wednesday. I'm looking forward to it. Sonny Johnson, everyone. Thanks, Sonny. Thank All you. right, guys. Bye. Well, joining us right now is our good friend Ash Gow from the Washington Examiner and New York Observer. Hi, Ash. Hey, how are you? I couldn't be better. How are you doing? Doing great. <laughs> um, well, looking at some of your pieces over at the Washington Examiner, the left continues to try to ruin sex for everyone, especially on college campuses. Yeah, they <laughs> There's this whole, you know, the the broadening of the definition of Title IX, where colleges must adjudicate sexual assault, which is generally a felony, but uh, the definition of what sexual assault or sexual harassment is on a college campus is so broad that pretty much anything anybody doesn't like 
ever can be considered sexual assault, sexual harassment. If, it, if, if you know, you're a woman and, and that's a man, or if you're a gay man and that's a man, or a lesbian and another woman, like anything like that, you know, you can just assume that it's, uh, you, you're receiving this treatment because of your sex, and then this person is now, uh, you get labeled a rapist no matter what the charge is. Um, and it's just gotten so insane. I mean, some of the, one of the definitions uh, basically states that um, sexual violence can include unwanted comments about someone's physical appearance. Which I mean, honestly, could be as mundane as someone telling their female friend that you, oh, you look good today, you know, or oh, you got a new haircut, it looks good, something like that, you know. If suddenly you don't like that guy, like now this is a Title IX offense, and and he can go uh, get expelled or or suspended for sexual harassment. Like it just it gets insane, and we've actually saw seen accusations where um, a man and a woman. Uh, they they sleep together one night, and then months later, she sees him with another girl, so she gets mad, so then she accuses him of raping her. Or we've seen an accusation where um, the, the two didn't have sex, and she was so mad uh, that it didn't happen, that, that she went and accused him. We had another one recently where the woman was so mad that she was asked to leave somebody's uh, room that she accused him of domestic violence. So we just, when anything is allowed, then everything is rape, and we have these situations on college campuses where it's just gotten insane, where really men can't even leave their, their dorm for fear of, of rubbing somebody the wrong way, and I don't mean literally rubbing somebody. <laughs> uh, you're just making somebody mad enough by whatever they say or do to get them to, to falsely accuse. Like, it's just, it's becoming a serious problem, and people pretend it's not a problem, and, and it's happening all across the country. So let me get this straight. If 5'6", 130-pound Hillary Clinton were a student on a college campus today, <laughs> and I'm a student on that campus, and I walked up to Hillary and said, you don't smile enough, that could be a potential Title IX violation? Absolutely. It can, they can even be brought by non-students against students. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. So you and I could wander onto any campus we wanted to, Ash, and make claims against men on that campus, and it would have to be adjudicated by the faculty advisor staff or whoever handles these things? Yes. Oh, my God. But they don't see the, like, the horror in this, the absurdity <laughs> in this, because they think due to those... Um, you know, basically faulty, I'll say faulty, but they're essentially fake studies that show one in five women are being sexually assaulted on college campuses by broadening the definition so that everything can be considered rape. And then these women who are answering in the affirmative, they're not saying they're victims, but the researchers are, are looking at the way they answer questions and say, yes, that makes you a victim. And these women themselves don't even say they're not a victim. They say the reason they didn't report was because it wasn't serious. They don't even see themselves as victims, but in order to push this narrative, the Obama administration and, and a whole lot of feminist uh, scholars, I'll put that in quotes, um, <laughs> are, are conducting these similarly flawed surveys in order to, to eviscerate due process rights for men. Because if you believe it's such an epidemic, then you think that the only reason to stop it is to just believe anybody who makes an accusation and that all men are potential rapists and all women are potential victims. It's, it's been a while since I've been on a college campus, but I can't believe that the male faculty at these college campuses have been so emasculated that no one would stand up and say, well, wait a minute, aren't we going a little bit too far here? No, they absolutely have been emasculated. One, if you want tenure, if you go along with the prevailing narrative, right, it, it's far easier and more popular to go along with this narrative. And you get called brave for speaking out for survivors, whereas it's not brave to speak out for somebody that everybody already is on the side of. Uh, it's, it's brave to stand up for the people that, are, that deserve it, that are not getting stood up for, you know. And that's, that's the falsely accused students, the students that are being accused 
because they didn't want to date a girl after hooking up with her or two students being equally drunk and only the man is responsible for rape. Um, mm. You know, things like that that are, that are difficult to talk about but are necessary. Ash, you wrote about a story that really started breaking last week, and I'm glad that you did. Um, the Clinton campaign apparently has been overcharging donors, and people are finally starting to stand up and, and push back. Um, can you talk about that? Right. There is an 81-year-old grandmother from Minnesota who first uh, tr- realized that um, she was being overcharged. She wanted to give a one-time donation to Hillary Clinton because she can't afford much. She wanted to give Hillary Clinton $25. Uh, When she received her next bank statement, she noticed that the campaign had taken out multiple charges of $25 and a charge of $19. And uh, her, her son says, oh, she's very good with the Internet. Now, your first thought is, okay, fine. She accidentally set up recurring uh, payments, Right. And that would be a plausible explanation, except for the fact that the charges came on the same day, multiple times on the same day, uh, the same day, and within the same month. And the final charge was for nineteen dollars. So if it was a recurring charge of twenty five dollars, it wouldn't be taken out multiple times the same day, multiple times the same month, and it wouldn't change randomly to nineteen dollars. So what it appears when uh, uh, one of my colleagues over at the New York Observer reached out to a Wells Fargo fraud department employee, said that they get about 100 calls a day from Clinton donors. They haven't gotten a single call from a Trump donor, but that this seems to be a regular thing with Clinton where somebody makes a one-time donation and the Clinton campaign campaign takes multiple um, uh, donations from them. And it's never more than $100 total, because if it's $100 total, then they get investigated for fraud. So they keep it below that. And they can take this money, hope nobody recognizes it, hope nobody actually calls. And uh, they say, uh, Wells Fargo says that it's been returning between $700 and $1,200 a day to donors. And that's not going to be reflected in Clinton's FEC filing. So here's the, here's the club is that they can sit here and claim that they have so many donations from small donors when in fact they don't because they're fraudulent claims. And, and the banks are covering this, right? It's not like they're going to the Clinton campaign and getting them to cough the money back up. They're just covering these charges. Correct. Basically. Yeah. So she's using the banks to pay for her campaign. (laughs) Essentially. Listen, I, I think we're being unfair here. I mean, the Clintons have no kind of track record whatsoever to point to this example and say, wow, they have a shady past. This is shady, too. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Squeaky clean images. Squeaky clean records there for both of them. But she did something similar in 08 as well, right? Her campaign had something going on like this. Uh, yeah, I think it was, it was similar to this. Back in 2008, they had uh, to return, what, $2.8 million worth of donations, <laughs> whereas Obama only had to return 900000 Um Yeah, it's just, this just seems to be a scheme to, to pump up their numbers and, and to make it look like more small-time donors give to them than actually do. And, I mean, this is really affecting, you know, this isn't being done to their 100,000 millionaire donors, right? Right, Or the people giving millions to the Clinton Foundation and then having it funnel through the campaign. No, this is happening to their poorest donors, like Mm -hmm. poor Carol Marr, who is the the example given in the, the, the article I wrote, who had actually, her son called the Clinton campaign. He said it took him like 40 or 50 phone calls to actually get a hold of somebody. They said mm-hmm. they would stop making the charges, but then like the very next day, the money started, they, the money, they started, they continued taking the money out. And so then, you know, he goes to, has to go to the bank because the other thing is that, okay, if the, the campaign said it stopped, it continued. So it should have stopped. Right. Mm-hmm. So then they have to go to the bank. So, I mean, it's just been this hassle for people. And, and it's, this isn't the big-time donors. This is the small-time donors like Carol Marr, the people who can least afford this. So they're stealing from poor people is what you're telling us. Basically. Yeah. 
brazenly, and, it appears. Right. And so it wasn't helping. So what Mar and her son did was that they finally went to uh, local news, which is an NBC affiliate out in Minnesota, who, who did the uh, initial investigation on this. And then, um, you know, my colleague at the observer talked to a Wells Fargo employee and, and did some more research on this, but the initial, you know, story from Mar was an NBC affiliate. So you can't even really sit here and say, Oh, it was some right wing news organization, you know? Right. Right. Well, and it's owned by Trump's son-in-law, which they disclose right. so, at the end of every single New York observer article. that's written about the political campaign season. Right. But it doesn't even matter because, like, this particular story was um, uh, an NBC affiliate. And so the Mars said that after their story aired, they got contacted by a whole bunch of other people that have experienced similar things. So it's not even just them. You can't, like, discount this as just, like, oh, this is just one little, one person had this. Like, they're hearing from other people. The Wells Fargo person hears from 100 people a day. Mm -hmm. And have any other banks piped up and said this is going on there, too, or are they all just cowed into silence? That I haven't seen. I don't know how many have been donating to Clinton, though. Yeah, well, they don't donate. They just invite her to speak and dump a bunch of money in her lap. <laughs> right. That's easier. And even that Wells Fargo employee spoke on the condition of anonymity because, I mean... Of course. She's going to speak it, like... <laughs> I, there was actually this really hilarious Onion article last week that was like, new mo like what was it pneumonia uh, regrets infecting Hillary Clinton because <laughs> yes. it learned what what happens when you cross the Clinton. And I feel like there's like a bunch of bank employees out there that are like, oh god, this is a really terrible thing that they're doing, but I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, I'm looking at the original article from this NBC affiliate out in Minnesota, and this came out early June. Right. And now it's just kind of broken through to a larger audience. And I assume it will go well, nowhere because the left press will never touch it. I was really shocked because it made Drudge Thursday. It was the mm -hmm. most red thing on The Observer. And yet nobody, like, come Friday, I wanted to write about this. And I wasn't even seeing, like, Breitbart. Right. Writing on this. And I was like, what? The Daily Caller finally did like a couple hours before I did, but it was mostly like blogs. And I was just, why is this not getting more attention? This is insane. This is awful. Yeah, there's no way to spin your way out of this one. This is not a mistake. As you said, the gentleman who got involved on behalf of his mother, I believe he's an attorney too, right? Yes. Had, had called the, the Clinton campaign 45 to 50 times. And they, then they tell him, oh, they're going to fix it. And then, boom, a charge goes through again. And they're right. brilliantly keeping it right under the $100 mark. So no computer error is going to be that crafty. Right. But can't get the story out that we're, she's blatantly stealing from poor people. Exactly. It's so easy to miss a small transaction like that. I mean, right. Uh, it could be happening to people that have more money that just aren't as meticulous about keeping track of their bank balance. Right. Exactly. There's how many people just don't notice these things. Sure. With ATM fees and all the rest of it, if you put it on your ATM card, you might not even notice that they, you know you have close to $100 missing. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, something else that people haven't noticed is apparently Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine wrote a book <laughs> that nobody and bought. nobody wanted to read it. <laughs> tell, tell us yeah, about. less than, uh, fewer than 3,000 copies sold in the first week, which according to the New York Times AP, the first week book sales account for a third of all sales. So this book, probably not even a third, probably more for this book because it's basically a policy book that was released two months before an election and nobody wants to read a policy book. We saw Obama do this in 2008, I believe. Um, I think, uh, what was the other one? Somebody else like did this uh, a few years earlier or Clinton did this back in 92, I believe. And it says people don't want to read your policies and they don't want to pay to read your policies right. in book form. Like policy is already a really boring dis topic of discussion and then to pay money to read your policies. Like shouldn't they be on your website? Or shouldn't you be and, speaking uh, about them maybe? 
Right, exactly. And and wondering who those 3,000 people who were who did buy the book. The I Clinton mean, it was Foundation. probably like publisher, Clinton Foundation, right. Right. Well, the great thing about writing a book instead of speaking is you can eliminate the cops in the book. <laughs> uh, but my question to you, Ash, is where did Hillary Clinton find the time to write this book? I mean, she's such an amazing woman to be able to campaign uh, and, and still have the time, find the time to write this book with Tim Kaine. I'm sure she wrote the whole thing uh, with Tim and didn't have any help, right? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure it wasn't ghostwritten by anybody. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I will note is that they did not receive an advance for the book, which oh, good. is good to know that, you know, no publisher paid them millions of dollars for this piece of crap. Which well, is, sh I can't believe they would write anything without getting an advance. Right. I mean, Tim Kaine, probably not. I don't know enough about him, but... Um, Hillary definitely doing something without money. What? Right. What was the advance on her last book that sold a pitiful number? Wasn't it like 14 million or something? Yeah. Yeah. Her last book, the uh, hard, what was it? Hard, hard choices. choices. The one that stole its cover and name from Carly Fiorina's tough choices. Yes. Uh, but, and this was also like Hillary's second memoir, which to me is like, how many memoirs are you allowed to write? I think Obama had two. And yes. uh, he, his first one was when he was, like, 40, which is just like, dude, what do you do? It's like, might as well be a millennial at this point. Like, let me write my memoirs, and people want to read what I've been through. I've accomplished nothing, but let me read it. And, like, his book only really took off after he became president or when he was running for president. But, um, yeah, they, Hillary's last book, Hard Joyce's, sold like 70,000 copies in its first <laughs> week. But it, uh, that was... It was expected to do more. Yeah. So I, yeah. You would Even think if somebody's like that kicking well. out 14 right. million, they expect of, some sales. Yeah. And with all of the hype, oh, it sold 85,000 copies in its first oh. week, but it was expected to do better. Her, uh, her first memoir back in 2003 sold six times as many copies in its first week as Hard Choices. So, I mean, and that was Hard Choices having you know, so much hype around it because she was about to run for president, you know? Mm -hmm. Still didn't do good enough, well enough. It's obviously sexism. <sighs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what Obama's saying now. Yes. If Hillary loses, it's because of sexism, sexism and not her flaws. And, and a whole lot of her feminist supporters have been trying to tell me that, too. And it's just people barely see Hillary as a woman, a woman? versus a man because she's... <laughs> Well, because no, because she's been in the public eye as a politician. She's no different than any male, corrupt male politician that's right. been in office that's made a career out of making money somehow in public office. Like she's not any different than them. No, no, I've been and saying so this. like I also love this idea of like, well, why there hasn't been a woman president? Well, like women don't run for president. Like it's been. There's been one, at least, there was two this cycle, but there's been one per cycle of a major party. I mean, it's like women don't, might not want to run for president. Part of it <gasps> no. is the reason that Nancy, right, I know, every woman is just as ambitious as every man, absolutely. No, but there's like Nancy Pelosi's reasoning behind not running for higher office. She didn't want to put her family through... You sure. know, the grind. And a lot of women also don't want to do that. And a lot of Republican women look at it and know that the media is going to portray them as, like, stupid, like they did Sarah Palin and might not want to go through that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we're just all going to have to get used to the fact that if Hillary loses, they're, the left, they're already writing the think pieces that America, ladies and gentlemen, just wasn't ready for a woman president. Right. Well, it couldn't possibly be we're not ready for this woman president. Right. Right. Well, that was there was a New York Times poll just last week that said people are really happy that a milestone for women has been reached, but half of them would have preferred a different woman than Clinton. Sure. Yeah. I so mean, it's psychologically, not not, it's now, not that people aren't happy about this. It's that they don't like Clinton. Right. Right. And as Scott Adams has pointed out, like psychologically, now we see that a woman can get at the t to the top of the ticket, and that's just as good as a woman being president. We know that that barrier has been broken, if there if there ever existed a barrier. 
there may have existed a barrier at one point, but I mean, that's a lot of things with like millennial women are just like, yeah, we knew this would happen at some point in our lifetime. We're not like thinking it was never going to happen because there's no like, you know, secret barrier that's like, nope, we can't let a woman win. <laughs> it's just that there hadn't been a woman that we wanted to win. I mean, look like in and 2012, still Michelle been. Bachman, mm-hmm. we didn't want, you know, like people didn't want Carly Theory. And I think she w- would have been a better first woman president than Hillary Clinton. But, you know, she was also running against 16 men. Like she was one of the field. And, you know, she didn't really, she had a small campaign that wasn't really prepared for the amount of attention she got after that first main stage debate. And she kind of just kept repeating answers and didn't have much more to offer. Mm -hmm. Well, this isn't even a woman breaking the glass ceiling and winning. This is the system was rigged for a woman to get the nomination. Right. And they've been prepared for this with with Obama. It's like America's too racist for a black president. Well, he can even being the most popular president, like almost like in modern times, right? He came in Mm -hmm. with like a 60 something percent approval rating, despite being the first African American president. Right. And, I mean, and he, you know, America, a racist country, like, he won, even though he had no business being president, because he had only been in the Senate a couple of years and had really accomplished nothing in his life. Right. No, and then he won re-election. Imagine right, that. exactly. This apparently racist country, where it's like, if Hillary, if it had been probably almost any other woman. Yeah, pretty much. Like, even Nancy Pelosi is very, very disliked doesn't have she has the like oh she lies a lot but she doesn't really have the the level of corruption behind her that hillary does and then there has been some issues with pelosi but it's not as big in the american public's eye as as hillary's own corruption which is just a problem she is the worst female candidate that could have been put up we're traitors to our sex if we don't vote for her which i'm perfectly happy to be which is another thing where, where if you get accused of being a gender traitor because you don't support <laughs> this woman, like you have to support her in order to continue being a woman. Like, this, this is just absurd. <laughs> all right. Follow Ash on Twitter at Ash Gow. And, of course, you can check out all of her work at the New York Observer and the Washington Examiner. Ash, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Talk to you then. Hey, that's it for this week's Enough Already podcast. We thank Sonny Johnson and Ash Scow. Tracy, where can everyone find the Enough Already podcast? Everyone can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and SoundCloud. If you forget all of those, you can look on Facebook. And if you can't remember that, you can go to enoughalreadypodcast.com. Music for the Enough Already podcast is provided by YoPaulyMusic.com. Our thanks go out to Paul Coteau for that. And you can follow everyone you heard today on Twitter. You can follow me at Tracy L. Connors. He's at Fingers Malloy. Sonny Johnson is at Sonny Johnson. That's S-O-N-N-I-E. And at Ash Scout to follow Ash. All right. Thanks for listening. Have a good week. We'll be back next week with an all-new Enough Already podcast.